Here's a question. How many years do you have left? How long will you live? It's not a comfortable thought. Certainly not a thought our live-in-the-moment culture encourages, but it's worth reflecting on. Whatever amount of years you might imagine you have left, how do you see yourself spending them? What will you do? Most of us would prefer to remain strong and vital as we age, so we can participate fully in life and do the things we love. But just how do we go about making that our reality? Hello and welcome to the Over 50 Health and Wellness Show. I'm your host, Kevin English. I'm a certified personal trainer and nutritionist, and my mission is to educate and inspire you to become the strongest, healthiest, most vital version of yourself. My guest this week is Steve Mansfield. Steve is the 63-year-old creator of the Mansfield Method, which focuses on longevity and elite-level fitness. Steve grew up in rural eastern Kentucky, where he spent his boyhood being outdoors. Most of us listening to this right now can probably relate to a time when our parents would shoo us out of the house and tell us to go play and be back in time for dinner or before dark. Steve got into martial arts at a young age and played sports in school and was a good athlete. He went on to become a decathlete in college. Just as a refresher, the decathlon comprises of, of course, 10 events and is generally held over two days. Day one would be the 100 meter run, a long jump, shot put, high jump, and then a 400 meter run. And then on day two, you'd have 110 meter hurdles, discus throw, pole vault, javelin throw, and finally a 1500 meter run. A knee injury eventually ended his decathlon career, but shortly after he found a new passion, rock climbing. I had a a good friend that uh, I played sports with in high school who was really athletic, not to the point where he could go play college level sports, but he was very athletic and we were both very much into the outdoors. And he basically had saw a magazine about rock climbing. This is probably 1979. And he met a guy that was rock climbing. And in fact, the, the, this guy eventually wrote the first rock climbing guide to Red River Gorge in Kentucky. And uh, he just said, this is really wild and it's one of the hardest things I've ever done athletically. I, I can't believe that anybody does this because it's super hard athletically for the entire body. Plus, it's mentally challenging to the point of swallowing panic for up to multiple hours at a time. And so I was immediately interested. And so we went out and basically self-taught ourselves with the help of a few people that were very early adopters to rock climb. And I immediately fell in love with rock climbing because of that. Things with you and I have talked about earlier here today and even uh, some of the stuff that you've written about on your website, which is it's a full body and full mind experience to rock climb at a medium level or a higher level. Today, you're seeing people <laughs> that are doing it at a level that this was completely unfathomable to us at that time in the late 70s, early 80s. But uh, I fell in love with that. And then when I felt like I'd reached about where I could reach physically with rock climbing only. That's when I became interested in mountaineering. Mountaineering, the same thing, just an incredible all over body workout plus the mental aspects, the engineering, mountaineering aspects all put into one thing. I thought it was just some of the most challenging things that human beings can do physically. And so, of course, me being me, I was drawn to that. <laughs> So Steve finds himself in love with rock climbing. He likes the physical as well as the mental challenges and eventually finds his way into full-blown mountaineering. And he's in the right place. Red River Gorge in Kentucky is the climbing destination in the eastern United States. It is. River Gorge, uh, for a long time, was the mecca worldwide for Mm -hmm. uh, sport climbing, rock climbing. And it just so happened it was in my backyard there in eastern Kentucky. So I was able to drive to it very, very easily, 45 minutes away from where I was living. And so, yeah, it, it's a mecca. New River Gorge in West Virginia, also uh, close to where I lived. Also a mecca worldwide for sport climbing, rock climbing, and traditional climbing. They call it trad climbing. All. So I was lucky in that. And if you've done any rock climbing beyond just tinkering around in the, in the rock climbing gym, if you've done any real rock climbing, you'll see how incredibly difficult 
that this sport is physically and mentally. And I have to say that, you know, rock climbing, mountaineering, it changed my whole outlook on fitness and it changed the level of what that I thought a human body could reach physically. And it still permeates my fitness philosophy today because of just the, the intensity level of it. And one of the things that happened when I was rock climbing and mountaineering, I trained, you, you become insular in your uh, environment. I see this in CrossFit athletes also. And you, so you're training and you're doing all these things and you tend to think this is just normal. This is how people train. This is the level of fitness people reach because everybody I knew was. And it wasn't until many years later that I realized, no, nobody was doing this. We were part of a very, very small group of people that were training with this kind of intensity and reaching this kind of athletic uh, performance during that period. So it, it, it was incredibly important, a real catalyst for me in, in my fitness journey. I could certainly see how that would be. You said a lot of things there. I wanted to back up, though. Not everybody listening, you had made reference to sport climbing and trad or lean climbing. Can you pick that apart for us a little bit? And let's start with maybe just the definition between what is sport climbing versus what is trad climbing? Sport climbing, generally, you know, these are pretty wide definitions, but generally sport climbing is where you're clipping bolts, meaning as you climb, there's bolts that are set into the rock that uh, climbers have done, usually on repel, and just used a rock drill and drilled in some bolts. And that is your protection as you go up. So you clip your rope to the bolt using a carabiner and a nylon runner. And so it's adventuresome, certainly, but not as adventuresome as if you didn't have bolts that you could simply clip on the way up. When this practice first started, a lot of us traditionalists didn't really love the fact that you were defacing the, the rock. Uh, and uh, also you were looking for adventure and you're not getting as much of it. But it has turned into something that's quite acceptable in certain areas. And usually the sport climbs are very athletic, very gymna gymnastic, and you do clip the bolts and that, that's the sport climbing. In all rock climbing, remember, free climbing means you're only using the equipment to protect you in case of a fall. You're not climbing the equipment in any way. You're not using the equipment to help you get up the, the climb. So sport climbing is still that, but you're clipping bolts. And the traditional climbing, you're using pieces of equipment and basically sticking them in a crack or, or sky hooking them over a, a, a protrusion, and that is your protection. So it's not nearly as a solid thing. It's just clipping bolts. And so it's much more adventuresome meaning those pieces, if you don't set them correctly, if you fail on those, they could pop and that would be a real problem. So it gets in your head a little bit more if you're doing traditional climbing or trad climbing over sport climbing. Uh, traditional climbing, of course, was my uh, thing, and that was how it all started. Once they stopped just slamming pitons into cracks, which was, <laughs> that's how it was done in the 50s and 60s. And so, in this way, you leave the rock face completely unbothered in that you just take that protection out as you go up. The, so it's, it's a very clean way, a, a very, you know, nature forward way of climbing. And that's what traditional climbing is. And then, of course, mountaineering and alpinism is where you're, you're actually climbing the big mountains. People think about Everest and all that, but certainly there's millions of, of ways to do that other than Everest. That's just what people, mountains that people know, but there's in, it, in the United States, there's glaciated mountains that you can climb uh, all over. So it's you can get into some serious climbing here in the United States. And that's when you have to do everything, you know, winter camping, you know, crampon use, crevasse rescue, rock climbing skills. You have to put it all together. Right. Okay. So thanks. So there's obviously different types of, of climbing. Some of us might be familiar with bouldering, which is not using any harnesses or ropes and not therefore normally not going very high. And that's what your typical casual person walking into, say, a climbing gym might experience. You've got this sport climbing, which, as you said, you're clipping in as you go up and you have a blare. So your fall risk is, is pretty well mitigated there. And then you have the drag climbing, which is typically one person going up and, like you said, setting pieces of protection in, on natural features and, and then climbing upwards. And then the person who's belaying on the bottom is typically then going to take his turn, his or her turn, and come up and clean those pieces, as you said, as they go up. But in no case is the climber at any time, say, using the rope to pull themselves up right there. It is completely just a, a natural climbing. Now, I want to go back. You had, I think you called it early on, swallowing panic. 
I think most of us might imagine that when when we get up high and we're relying on this, I think you even said it's more adventuresome. And so as you're getting up higher, there's the, of course, there's the height, but then there's there's the fear. There's the potential for panic as you start to worry about maybe equipment failure or your your mental or physical failure in these types of situations. What is it about fear and overcoming that that really appealed to you? Because I have to imagine that's a big part of any rock climber's journey. It definitely is. Even if you're not afraid of heights, which a lot of people are, but even if you're not afraid of heights, it is absolutely in your genetic makeup, in your DNA, to not put yourself in danger with height. It's it's completely natural, and it's not something that most people can control beyond a certain point. Alex Honnold can, if you've seen you know his free solo videos uh, where he's free soloing El Capitan, 3,000-foot vertical granite slab, with no rope. He can, but he's the Mozart of climbing. He's once in a thousand generation performer in that particular sport. But for most, you know, 99.99% of people, you can't get rid of that. So it's all you can do is manage that and managing that fear and managing that panic. Because if you don't, you can get in some really, really bad situations. And that appealed to me to be able to try to control that mentally. And it's, as an athlete in general, so much of it is, is mental, as you well know, and especially a competitive athlete. And learning to control that at that high level certainly appealed to me. And I think it, if you can learn some techniques of doing that, it can affect the rest of your life in many, many ways, in a very positive way, your ability to control things. Everything, you know, we talk about meditation from in mindfulness, you know, trying to, to be in the moment and focus on breathing, all that stuff. You definitely have to do that same type of thing at a different level when you're rock climbing, mountaineering. And then when you're not doing that, it teaches you this kind of mental control that you can use in a lot of different ways. And as you and I are talking about longevity, it can definitely help your mindfulness practice. If you were able to do that on the side of a vertical or more than vertical concrete or granite slab, you can apply that to mindfulness. What Steve is saying here can apply to all of us. We don't necessarily need to overcome our fear, but rather learn to manage it. And I suppose a pretty good place to learn to manage fear would be 100 plus feet up in the air, hanging off the side of a mountain. But think of all the ways this might apply to the rest of your life. Certainly, if you can manage fear and panic in these intense but controlled situations, you'd be better prepared to deal with stressful situations in other areas of your life. Hearing Steve talk about climbing and mountaineering begs the question, what kind of person does those things? Who seeks out these experiences? Crazy people? Adrenaline junkies? They definitely exist. You you meet those guys when you're out there doing this. You meet the guys that are adrenaline junkies. They generally don't stay with a, a particular thing long because a great example is skydiving. You know, I've done my share of that too. And it's incredible the first 20, 30 times you do it. I mean, your adrenaline goes through the roof. After that, it doesn't. And so with adrenaline junkies, they usually go on to something else. This is a different thing. It's the feeling of psychological and emotional success, and which is definitely makes you feel good. <laughs> so I think that is more what you're going to see with these type of athletes than actual adrenaline junkies. Certainly they're out there, but usually they have to get that fix and you're not going to get that fix all the time or very long. There has to be some kind of consistency in whatever the project is that you're pursuing. And so I definitely don't think it's so much a gremlin junkie. I'm sure it's a component, but uh, that's not all of it. Yeah, well said. And I, I love that you mentioned that. I think you said psychological and emotional uh, success is what you're lo- is kind of the outcome you're looking for there. Now, are you still climbing today? Do you still get out and climb? Yeah, yeah, I still get out and climb some, um, usually with my adult daughters. We like to climb together. We've had quite a few fun adventures together. We were just in New River Gorge a couple of years ago together. 
so yeah, I, I try to get out there, but of course, you know, as a stage of life change, uh, you're not able to do it as much as you could, as you used to. But uh, yeah, I still try to keep my hand in. And even in between there, I'll try to go to, to gyms, uh, to rock climbing gyms, just to try to keep some of the skills and, and body management, uh, you know, able to handle your body uh, using just your arms and legs at a high level. You can do a lot of that stuff in the climbing gyms. So I, I still will frequent those from time to time to make sure I'm still doing that. I think that's an incredibly important part of overall fitness and health and longevity is your ability to control your body at a high level just with your arms and legs. Yeah, that that's well said. And certainly climbing is one of those body awareness type things where you've got to be able to control your body in space. And a lot of people might imagine, well, you just need to be really, really strong, right? I'm going to grab hold of this and pull myself up. But so much of climbing is so much more technique. In fact, my daughter, when she was much younger, 14, 15 years old, maybe 16, was on a competitive climbing team for a while. And it would always amuse me when there would be some, say, some young Marines, big, strong, strapping young lads in the climbing gym. And my daughter would watch them climb for a little while and then she would hop on and just just breeze through the route that these guys are, you know, kind of scratching their head and saying, why can't I muscle up this thing? And she's just this little tiny thing. But it's that body awareness and that perception coupled with really just that technique, right, of understanding your body and space and balance and position. And I suppose that would that is a great framework for future longevity and overall athleticism, right? Absolutely. What you're describing, I've seen so, so many times, men especially. And, and I think you being in the fitness world, you've seen this, like men so much focus on that upper body strength because that's easy. Looking like a beer keg on two straws is what I call some of those guys. But And so for, for those guys in the, in the climbing gym or on the, on the rock itself, you know, they're just trying to do pull-ups. And you, you can't do that. I mean, I don't care how strong you are. You can't do 5,000 pull-ups. And I've also noticed with females, they because they genetically don't usually have as strong upper bodies as men, they will use their legs just instinctively when they climb. Men will not use their legs. Their legs are just hanging dead, dead weight when they climb, which I've always found amusing. And so they they just instinctively are climbing with incredibly poor form. And then people like your daughter are just firing through that. But Yes, full body awareness is a big part of, of doing that. And I think that's something that so many seniors really lose, uh, is their body awareness. They, some of the people I've trained, the seniors that I've trained, their body awareness is at a very, very low level. Absolutely. And yeah, and I'm, I'm with you hundred percent there. And I'm really thankful that there's folks like you out there that are aware of this and trying to change that tide a little bit. So. This might be a good segue here. You know, it sounds like you've had a very full, very active life. You mentioned early on some sports and decathlon. And of course, we got the rock climbing and mountaineering, martial arts throughout your life. Uh, you had mentioned skydiving. I, I know that you've done some scuba and some hang gliding as well. In one of your, I think it was in one of your blog posts, you made a comment that said, we were born to be fit and that we have to work at being unfit. Yeah, kind of help us understand that a little bit. What's your what's your train of thought around that? Well, I'll make the point that we we were born to be fit, and I think maybe another part of this discussion or another discussion later we can discuss what actual fitness really is. But we were born to be fit. We were born to get out there and hunt and gather and move and run and jump and all those things. We were born to do that. You know, evolution has it works, but it doesn't work very fast. So we've evolved to a certain point and it took, you know, all the time that it took for us to evolve to this point physically, but technology evolves really, really fast. Industry and technology evolves really, really fast. So technology and industry has allowed us to not have to hunt and gather for food, not have to run, not have to jump, not have to do all these things, but our body hasn't adapted to it. You know, you see these science fiction shows or, what was it, Wally? That would, it actually did kind of show this evolution uh, speed, uh, sped up in space, where the humans got kind of really obese and, and very soft, and over time, over a, a time period, as they lived in space and they were catered to by robots, and at a much lesser scale and less humor scale, that's what's happened with us. So our evolution can't catch up 
to the technological and industrial evolution of this, our culture and our society. So we're still, we still have the body though. That we were still born with the body to be fit, to be able to run, to be able to jump, to be able to hunt, to be able to gather, to be able to do all those things and all the things physically that go with those things. In one of my blogs, I don't know if you got a chance to read it. I, I talk about photography that came into its own in the 1860s, really, and, and later. And I said, just go and just check out some photography from 1860 to 1890 or whatever and try to find the people that look out of shape. Try to find the people that look obese. You won't find them. They, they just, it didn't exist because the technology and the in industry wasn't at a point that allowed us to have the lifestyle that we have today with food and exercise. And it was incredibly rare. I even show at one point, uh, there were, you know, the horrible things they used to have called sideshows and they had the fat lady of the circus. And there was a picture of the fat lady of the circus. And I mean, if we saw that lady today, we would think, I think I just saw her in Walmart. I, I don't know, but I, I wouldn't even notice her. In 1890, she was so unique, so unbelievably obese that people would pay money just to look at her. And that's how much has changed in 100 years, 150 years. And it's not because of some of the factors, so many of the factors that you hear that you know, maybe it's genetic or whatever. It's our bodies were born to be fit, but we've really had to work hard to build a culture and then and inside that culture build a lifestyle that makes us so very unfit. Yeah, that's that's very, very well said. We have certainly in our technological age have built a society and a culture that that keeps us unfit. And that's an interesting perspective. Over time, fitness wasn't a thing in and of itself, right? It was just baked into the way for tens or hundreds of thousands of years, how we lived, the, the way we moved, right? And now that technology in the last, just even say, 100 years or so has moved so fast, evolutionarily, our bodies have not caught up to that. So into that is born this fitness industry, right? So somebody like me that's in front of a computer for hours on end, I manufacture a way to work. And for me, that's you know working out, right? But once upon a time, we we certainly didn't do that. The fitness industry is big and wide. It's a multi-billion dollar industry. And there's all these bizarre things we do. If you just stop to think about a treadmill or stationary bike for a minute, that's just a really bizarre thing. And I think that recently there's been more of this push towards what we'll call the functional fitness side of that fitness industry. But still, the all the cardio places, all the you know the globo gyms, things like that, they're still having their day as well. I heard on somebody else's podcast uh, they were talking about when you go into one of these big commercial gyms, most of the people working out are on the machines and they're either sitting or laying down. And the person discussing this was just saying, "Well, think about that for a minute. If the idea is to be functionally fit, to be able to do things like you're talking about, just very basic things, to be able to to walk, to run, to bend over, pick up something heavy, put it up over your head, etc., you're not really maximizing your time in that gym if you're with that full muscle recruitment. If you're sitting on a machine or laying on a machine, so it's really interesting how far we've come in this in this new fitness industry in a way to." try to reclaim some of this, what you call our birthright, how we were born to be, to born to be fit. Yeah. I mean, the the gyms can be fantastic tools. Uh, don't get me wrong. They can be unbelievable tools, but we have to understand that the gyms were created, you know, through capitalism as a business, and it's primarily to separate you from a dollar. But you have to make use of the equipment that you're renting. And a lot of people that... Like you said, that's that's not something that's been real effective for their overall health. Definitely, their overall fit, fitness, health, longevity. Uh, these are shrines to fake work. They're big, huge temples of pretend labor. And like you said, that we were saying there is we didn't used to have to do that. That was you said baked into our culture, baked into our day to day lives. And so I, sometimes I think it's almost comical that like the treadmills that. I can't imagine my grandfather comprehending that someone would need to walk on a treadmill. These things are are almost ludicrous in a way, but they're they've become necessary in this high technological culture that we live in now. But it all is pretend work, fake work. But another thing that happens in in gyms and 
gym equipment is it becomes very, very specialized. I have a machine that works my outer bicep, a machine that works my inner bicep. You know, I have, it becomes so incredibly specialized. And that's one of the reasons people are just laying down or sitting down doing the work. That's, I think, a big problem. And uh, I know you, you've experienced CrossFit. That's one of the, a, a good example of, of trying to get out of that type thing. But, you know, even just most of my training is outside. Most of my training is body weight based. Not all of it. I, I use kettlebells a lot. I do use some free weights too. But it's so much of it is calisthenic based, looking for that whole, whole body fitness, looking for functional fitness at a very, very high level. Okay. That, yeah. And that's a perfect segue to what I w- really want to talk to you about is that whole body functional fitness, that elite level fitness. To your point, unless you're a very high level competitive bodybuilder and you're really working on, you know, just tweaking that peak of your inner bicep, for example, th- those machines are, have become so specialized. But what you're talking about is something completely different. You had mentioned most of it being outdoors, which is where, you know, evolutionary, we spent <laughs> the majority of our, of our lives and it being a lot of body weight, calisthenic type work. Talk to us a little bit about your philosophy on exercise. What is it that you're, you personally do and what are you prescribing for some of your, your folks over 50 that uh, you're working with? So I'll even back it up a little bit more to, I think that there is a, a real dearth of information, and I'm glad that you're one of the people that is trying to get the good information out. Uh, you're actually among the few, in my opinion, of what what is it we're really trying to achieve with fitness? What what does that even mean? And I think it's confusing because when you see media, often fitness equals bodybuilding. Fitness equals for men big muscles, for women kind of less big muscles and a very, very low level of body fat. Big muscles, though, that's a big one <laughs> for men, especially. And for women, it's not as big, but and then a very, very cut body. All of that I've just discussed with you right then is an aesthetic. It has almost nothing to do with your health. It has almost nothing to do with your how good you feel through, through the day. It has nothing to, to do with your longevity. It just is an aesthetic. And that's to me, nothing wrong with bodybuilding. It's, it's fine as long as you, you're not confusing that with that is what healthy is and that is what fit is. It could be, but it's often not. So that's one thing. The other thing is, and I saw you, you've struggled with this, I think some in, on your fitness journey is it doesn't also mean an extreme sport, meaning a triathlon, a, a marathon, an ultra marathon. <laughs> be able to do more things, live longer if you do that. But these are the types of things that the media seems to focus on and throw at people that are like, well, you know, I would like to get fit, but I don't know if I can train for a marathon or not. You know, I'm not sure I have time. No, you don't need to. That's insane. (laughs) Especially for a a senior, I mean, training for a marathon, the repetitive use injuries are going to be rampant. And bodybuilding is not necessarily, that's not necessarily functionally fit. That not that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to feel better, look better, meaning that you're overall fit. So I think there's there's so much out there that where people are confused about what even does it mean to be fit. Uh, but my philosophy is being fit means a first of all it means being healthy. If you're healthy, you have a chance to be fit. In my practice, I've seen a lot of, uh, I've even drawn a graph for people and it's kind of this big arc. And it's, it's so between the ages of like 20 and 40, almost all of your fitness is about an aesthetic. I want bigger arms, I want bigger shoulders. If you're a woman, you want better legs, you want a bigger butt, whatever. It's all about an aesthetic and very little to do with health. 40 to 50, 55, there's a mixture. <laughs> okay. It's also about an aesthetic. But it's also, hey, I actually want to be able to do more stuff. I want to be able to play with my kids. I want to be able to play with my grandkids. I want to be able to have fun on vacation. Then about 55 and 60, they don't care hardly at all about the aesthetic. And it's almost all about health. And I wish I could move that graph to where it went all, you know, the the guys at 50 and 60 went all the way to the guys at 20. Because my philosophy is if you are fit and you are healthy, the aesthetic will take care of itself. It doesn't have to be the goal. 
It doesn't have to be the focus. That will just come automatically, and all these other benefits will come that wouldn't have come if you'd only focused on the aesthetic. So for me, fitness means being able to run fast, jump high, be strong, be able to get up and down off the ground easily, quickly, with little effort. One of the things I just mentioned is run fast. And I think that's another thing that's so much missed. Sprinting is super, super important. But we focus on jogging everywhere. Jogging or a little bit faster than a jog. When in real life are you ever doing that? We, we talked about the evolution of humans as a species. If a bear is chasing me, I'm probably not going to be at a light jog. I'm going to want to sprint. And as a 63-year-old man, how many 63-year-old men have you seen sprint? And that's one of the most important things we can do. And, and you know as well that sprinting is much better for fat loss and all the and, and muscle retention and muscle gain uh, than just jogging. But few people focus on. So I focus on those things, and I set a very high bar. One of the biggest things I get, and you may get this too, when clients start training with me is, Steve, I didn't even know the, the level of fitness that we're shooting for. I didn't even know that level of fitness existed. And that's a problem. People should know this level of fitness exists, but they don't because it's just, it's not focused on. Bodybuilding is focused on. Triathletes are focused on. Marathons are focused on. None of those things are going to get you to live a really long time at a high level. The, being elitely fit and then taking care, you know, all over, run fast, jump high, do things a long time, run a mile pretty fast, be able to do a bunch of push-ups, be able to do a few pull-ups. That's going to get you to where you want to go, in my opinion, much faster. And then the other things that we talked about, am I eating right? Because that's more critical than anything else. Am I sleeping right? Am I able to practice some mindfulness? Because all those things are going to add to that longevity. Steve brings up some great points here regarding fitness. We do a very poor job of defining fitness in our culture. Many of us see a guy or a gal with big muscles and assume they must be extremely fit. Or we see an elite marathon runner and assume that they are extremely fit. But in many cases, those folks aren't particularly fit, but rather they are very specialized. The bodybuilder has huge muscles, yet may be a very poor runner or have horrible mobility. The marathon runner can clearly cover an incredibly long distance in a fairly short amount of time, yet would most likely come up short on any real strength test, say a barbell back squat. The way Steve is defining fitness is more well-rounded and includes everyday functional movements that our bodies were designed to do. I asked Steve about his thoughts on nutrition and how our diets might affect our fitness and longevity. It's a moving target, of course, with all the research out there. And I really think people need to do the research. You, you, you should do your own research, certainly. I, I know you do tons of research. And I always say, don't just use Google. <laughs> use Google Scholar. Um, Google Scholar is going to take you to actual studies. Just using Google is going to bring you to some guy thinks this. So try to use Google Scholar and, and, and things like that other, if you're doing your own research. But that being said, I think... Currently, it, it's pretty obvious that the Mediterranean type diet is the best for overall fitness and longevity. And I think in my, my personal journey and working with clients, really watching the meat intake is also super important. I myself is pretty much a pescatarian. You know, red meat especially has to be taken in, in very moderate amounts. I can give you even just colloquial experience that I've had. At one point in my life, I had to, I would run a retreat, work a retreat where people would come in and through the entire retreat, they, they weren't allowed any red meat. And I would take their cholesterol on Sunday and then I would work them a week and then take it the next Sunday. Almost universally, their cholesterol would go down in one week just from that, just simply from that. And of course, we were exercising to death too. But the biggest thing, of course, was the, the meat intake. So I think in general, you know, the, the blue zone, the Mediterranean type nutrition. And I do think meat, especially as we get older, especially as we pass that 50 mark, we really have to moderate on our red meat because it, it has a direct correlation with inflammation, a direct correlation with, with high, higher cholesterol. 
And you had mentioned that Mediterranean blue zone diet. If you're listening to this, chances are you've, you've at least heard of that, but that's characterized by whole foods, right? It's going to be, to your point, pescatarian is going to be a lot of seafood for that protein portion and a lot of fresh vegetables and healthy fats, right? So it's famously the, the olive oil. But I, I think we'll both strongly agree that because we're all a little bit different, right? And to your point, you should do your own a your own research and b your own experimenting on yourself. If well, if I if I tweak my macros this way, or if I if I take this out of my diet, how does that make me feel, etc. But I think we could both agree universally that if we just reduce the amount of processed food we're eating and move towards more whole foods, that's a fantastic first step in any healthy diet. Is that fair? Yes, I think it's completely fair, and that's definitely what the Mediterranean type diets are. And the the reality is in this day and time, it's not hard to do. I do think when you and I were young, it was a little harder to do uh, because processed foods were just kind of being invented and everybody loved, oh my gosh, we can do this and we can do that. That's incredible. And it wasn't until later we realized that those <laughs> foods were yeah, often incredibly bad for us. So, but these days, I mean, you have so many options with getting better whole, fresh, foods than what you did even when you and I were younger, uh, that it, sh it shouldn't be something that's overwhelming, but it, it often can be to people that aren't used to the concept. Yeah, that, that's, that's true. I've read a statistic somewhere and I, I wish I had it on hand, but it was, uh, I can't remember, it was the average American's diet consists of approximately 70% of processed food, which just blows me away. That's a, a mind-blowing statistic. <laughs> Okay, this was actually a study that I had read in an online journal on the Atlantic. And what they found is that 57.9% of people's total caloric intake on average comes from ultra processed foods. Minimally processed or unprocessed foods accounted for 29.6% of our diet. So that's where the 70% of processed food in the average person's diet comes from. When you go into a grocery store, like a modern grocery store these days, uh, or let's say a, a Walmart grocery store, or a modern grocery store, almost nothing in there is good for you to eat outside of the produce department. I mean, it's that's kind of an amazing thing that where our culture is, is that you can walk into the Walmart grocery, which millions of people do, and almost nothing in there is good for you to eat outside of the produce section. That's not good. Uh, that's a, a, a bad thing that's happened to us in our culture. So when you and I talk about how easy it is, it's easy for us because we've been studying it a long time. And, and of course, at our age, we want to pass along what we've learned. But if you don't talk to somebody like us or, or haven't grown up thinking that's important, you just go to the grocery, you buy food and you eat it. But it's incredible that almost nothing in a, in a modern grocery store is good for you to eat. Yeah, I'm with you 100%. Yeah, we go to the grocery store because that's where the food is, right? But to your point, that's not where the food you should eat is. Uh, these big agri companies, big food companies, they're beholden to, to stockholders and they want to sell you more. And, you know, ways to do that is make it really hyper palatable and leave you, leave you hungry for more. So, yeah. You know, you hear often the the very simplistic advice, shop the perimeter of a grocery store, which has some some validity to it. But yeah, seeking out whole foods is certainly much, much better than going to a grocery store and just filling your shopping basket with the, the contents in there. You have to change your life philosophy. You know, if you do things like it's always been and you do things how things have always worked out, then you'll be dead at 74. That's your life expectancy. Is that what you want? I mean, because that's how things work. <laughs> that's the average. So, you know, you have to change your mindset. Yeah, that's that's you bring up a good point. And we also could make a distinction between a, a lifespan and a health span. I know that's been getting a lot of play in the media uh, recently where our lifespan is getting longer and longer. Right. We're we're living to longer ages. But our health span is that that is those years that were healthy and active and and physically capable is actually getting smaller that's a scary proposition for those of us aging, right? As you're coming into your 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, do you want those years to be productive and strong and healthy? Or do you want those to be filled with the metabolic diseases and derangements that come along with unhealthy lifestyles, the, the, the medications, et cetera? And there can be two different paths there for, for aging folks. 
I mean, while we may be able to keep some of these unhealthy people alive longer, it, in my opinion, obviously, it would be much, much preferable to spend those later years healthy and capable as opposed to the opposite of that. Yeah, I think there's a, little, there's a dualism there, too, with with this concept. Individually, it's pretty miserable, right? You're you're hanging around <laughs> and uh, and you're just existing in a painful way or in an unpleasant way. So no, nobody wants that. But the dualism is on that. Also, our culture tends to discard people once they pass the age of about 60. And so here you are, you're, you're 60. The new life expectancy, you know, maybe in 2050 or whatever is going to be 150. So half your life and you're irrelevant culturally. So, you know, if you're going to make the, these people irrelevant, then that's also a problem with their aging. So I think things need to change. Things need to change within our culture. Things need to change individually because, look, if you're going to be living longer than, like you said, you want a healthier health span. And so you need to do the things to ensure that that happens. My philosophy is if people do start living more commonly past 100, you're not going to have the kind of terrible health spans in general that you used to. I think if you're going to have people living to 120, or 110 or whatever regularly, they're going to probably have a better health span. I think all these things need to be addressed culturally as well as on an individual basis that you and I work with day to day. Yeah, ab absolutely. Yeah, I, I'm with you there. It's It can be a hard sell, right, for people, to your point, that have lived their whole life a certain way to to make these changes because it's not like something that you you make a change and you're done. It's 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 altering your lifestyle. It's altering the way you the way you live, the way you eat, and the way you go about your everyday life. I mean, uh, I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm a big proponent of making small changes that you can kind of weave into the fabric of your life and that are there permanently and building on those as opposed to big radical, okay, stop eating what you're eating today and completely switch to this. That's not shown to have long-term effectiveness in many cases. So No, it's it has to be, like you said, you have to make these small steps. You have to make the steps relatively easy. And before you know it, uh, over the course of time that you're in a completely different habit mold. But I, I will add to that, that one of the things I've seen with people that, that do kind of fight fight me on on some things in, to make their, their life uh, healthier and longer, I've even had people say, well, you know, I'd, I'd rather die younger than not be able to eat a hamburger every day or whatever. And I always say, man, that's easy to say now but harder to say toward the end. I mean, I don't I, I don't think you're going to have people like knowing that the end is nigh still saying sure glad I had those hamburgers. You know, it's it's a very short-sighted and a kind of an arrogant philosophy to have and it's easy to have those philosophies when you're not feeling really bad or or whatever. Yeah, once you decide you don't like that philosophy anymore, it's probably too late to change those yeah. those decades of eating the way they want to eat or whatever poor habit they've they've chosen throughout their life it's it's too late towards the end to you can you can make some changes but a lot of the damage you've done is is irreversible and at, at best you might be able to arrest some of that decline but too late to to change your choice once you're that far along that's that's a good and, point and like i said that and my point is that you Few, I believe, people are going to or be at that point in their life and still say, hey, I did it my way, buddy. Well, let's see. So we, we've talked a good bit about movement. We've talked a good bit about nutrition. And we've alluded a little bit to that recovery piece of that. I, you've mentioned mindfulness, meditation. You've mentioned, I think, briefly sleep. So for those of us that are wanting to focus on longevity and this elite level fitness, how does recovery play into that picture? Well, definitely for your listeners, recovery is an absolute critical thing to learn and, and, and recovery techniques are a critical thing to learn. Recovery is much more important in the older athlete and the older person than it was in the younger athlete who's recovering just naturally. One of the things that I also want to mention is, is connected to that is Intense workouts for people that are over 50, 
you definitely can get by and have great success with less workouts, intense workouts. I always say before 40 or maybe 50, three times a week, after 50, two times a week. The rest of the time is basically recovery. And I get a lot of pushback on that. They're like, no, no, I, the more work I do, the faster I'll see results. I want to work out hard every day. You won't. Uh, I always say, you remember the Arnold Schwarzenegger movie Conan, where apparently he became huge like that by pushing this plow-like thing, you know, when he was a slave. No, he would have died at 14 years old and he wouldn't have looked like Arnold Schwarzenegger. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. And in seniors, it's very, very important to give much more recovery time. If you even look at some of the athletes that maybe you yourself even kind of idolize as a younger man that continue to do it, you, if you research them, many, many of them have had hip replacements. Many of them have had knee replacements. Many of them have myriad injuries, chronic use injuries. And I think it's because they didn't have the information we have today. You need much more recovery time as you age than you did before. And then, of course, the recovery time itself is not simply resting. You can still be moving recovery. It's fine. Walking, jogging, playing tennis, whatever it might be. And then the things that we're, the research is really showing us now that is so important, which is sleep and, and overall mindfulness. Yeah, so that's that's well said. Certainly, we don't recover no. uh, like we did when we were 20, right? We didn't have to give any thought to recovery back then. But certainly over 50, over 60, over 70, that's where our bodies are different and recovery becomes a much, much more critical piece of that. And recovery takes a lot of forms. It's, it is that time off between intense workouts. And to your point, I think you were kind of alluding to, let's get that minimum effective dose. Let's get the most bang for our buck out of these, out of these workouts, but let's not go a hundred percent every day. No. That's, that's a recipe for overtraining and, and long-term ill health, not longevity and elite level fitness. So, but it's other things, right? It's certainly, it's sleep. Um, one of the most anabolic substances known to man is sleep and good, healthy sleep hygiene makes everything better. Certainly nutrition plays a piece into to your recovery. And I can tell you're really big because you, you keep bringing it up on that whole mindfulness, being present, having some sort of, I would guess, a practice whether that's a meditation practice or a journaling practice, what are your thoughts on quote unquote practicing this mindfulness that you're talking about? It's a little bit like you said, as far as uh, you have to kind of start slow in mindfulness and you have to find your way. The, the great thing about mindfulness is it doesn't have to take any specific form. I mean, you brought up journaling, you brought up meditation. It doesn't even have to take up any specific form, but it's a matter of centering yourself. As a matter of being clearly and completely in the moment. And man, with us boomers, that's just was not <laughs> something that was ever discussed, not something that was ever valued. And I think it's, it's a tough sale to seniors, a much easier sale to my younger clients than it is to seniors. But it's, you know, every study is going to show that it's going to add to your longevity to be able to have these moments every day, if possible, of being completely in the moment, completely focused on just your breath, completely focused on whatever, some other activity that uh, can can bring you to that place, even if it's just for 10 minutes, even if it's just for 12 minutes. It's been shown to a slow cognitive decline. It's been shown to add years to your life. It's been sl shown to slow telomere uh, shortening. So I think I said in one of my blogs that it, it's the critical centerpiece for your senior overall health and longevity journey. It's not, oh, and I'm also going to do that after I get done doing creature curls. You know, it, it, it has to be the center of it. And like I said, it can take many, many forms. It's, it's so esoteric in a way that you don't, it, it, which is also hard for boomers, also hard for people our age to, to, to get into that type of thing. But it's actually a good thing. Yeah, I, I agree wholehearted with you. Love all of that. I love that you call it the critical centerpieces, I think, what you said for those of us as we're aging. And along with that being present and that mindfulness and however that is manifest in your life, I, I think hand in hand with that goes stress reduction, right? Because we, the more we find out from researchers on the ill effects of stress, the more we're realizing that just all the bad things that come along with stress. And Clearly, going back to your point about once upon a time being able to sprint away from a bear, well, that stress response 
would have been probably life-saving, right? That fight or flight response. The problem is we get that exact same biological response when somebody cuts us off in traffic or our spouse says something that we don't like or we have a tough day at work. And for a lot of us, that accumulates into this chronic stress, which is extremely unhealthy for a number of reasons, uh, not the least of which is because it's absolutely pulling you away from being present and being mindful. Is that a fair way of saying that? No, I couldn't have said it better. It's it's really great. And and it does describe the, the modern man so much. And so much of this, this stress stuff, like you said, is it, somebody cut me off in traffic. It, it, we cannot go all the way back to where I talked about, you know, mind body control with rock climbing and, and learning those kind of techniques and how to control that all the way up to the mindfulness that we're talking about right now, because a lot of the stresses that we have are not even real. They're, they're something that can be controlled and, and utilizing mindfulness can get you to a place where you can control those things so much better because like you said, stress is the killer. Stress causes inflammation. Inflammation causes disease and death. So inflammation is a huge, huge byproduct of anxiety and stress. And so much of this stress is a phantom. I always say, if you're really experiencing a a stressful event, like like you're experiencing it and you can only manage it to a certain level, the only way to get rid of complete stress and anxiety is get rid of the thing that's causing you the stress and anxiety. And sometimes you can't. Uh, But uh, let's say you have a boss that is causing you constant stress and anxiety. You do need to, you can change that. You can get another job. It might be hard, but it'll be worth it because your boss is literally killing you. But a lot of times you can't. I have an intense fear of X. Well, the, the, unless you can get it out of your life, then you have to learn to manage it. But so, so that's important, managing that stress. But so much of stress these days is kind of a phantom stress. And so you can definitely remove the phantom stresses to a great extent by practicing the things we're talking about right now. You're right. Most of the things that we as modern people are stressed about are phantom stress. But unfortunately, we're still having that biological, biologically identical response to that stress, which is the cortisol, the inflammation, which leads to your point, illness, and eventually death. So bad, bad stuff. All right. Well, Steve, it sounds like then you've been active all your life. Certainly, you're passionate about your focus on fitness and on longevity. What what keeps you motivated? What what keeps you grinding away day in and day out with this? Well, a few things. You know, I, I have a five-year-old son at 63, so I want to be around for him. I want to do the same things that, with my five-year-old that I did with my, you know, 30-year-old uh, older children. So that's a big thing. But it, And overall, I also have a, a, a great passion for, like you said, what we're just talking about, which is all this, this fitness and physical activity and and, uh, you know, I still train people. I still train uh, not only seniors, but I train young people. I train military. I train law enforcement. And for some reason, they keep getting younger, even though <laughs> I, I tend to get older very quickly. I still want to do that. I'm still passionate about it. And I think it's important for seniors to have that thing, that the thing you're doing right now that you're passionate about is important for you to have this. It's important for you to still feel viable, to still feel plugged in, to plugged into society, plugged into the culture. And for me, I want to still be plugged in. I still want to be able to do the things that I love to do. And I don't want to have to stop doing them because of mental and physical decline. I want to put that off as long as possible. And so that's the kind of motivations that keep me in this. And I don't feel like they're unusual. I feel like most people, if they really thought about it, want the same thing, no matter what they may arrogantly tell their buddy. I think most people want this too. It just so happens that because I've been, I've reaped the benefits of an active lifestyle my whole life. I've been able to do things and see things that the vast majority of people didn't get a chance to do. I've never gotten a chance to do. And so, you know, I guess I'm passionate about life and passionate about the outdoors as well. And so I want to keep that going as long as possible for natural reasons. And I I really don't think I'm unique in this. I just think I I focus on it more than most people. Yeah. And I agree wholeheartedly that, especially as we're aging, that it's critical to have that passion in your life. And for me, it's obviously, it's very similar to you, right? It's, It's very much that healthy lifestyle and 
that really lights me up and certainly sharing that with other people and being connected in that way. But whatever, as you're aging, whatever that thing is that really lights you up or really gets you going, you, I think it's important to have that passion because when you, when you lose that, I, I think you lose a lot of your just kind of will to live, right? And that's, that's not good for longevity and vitality. I don't think we understand it from a scientific point of view, but I think colloquially we've, we've all seen it. When you don't have this passion, you don't have this feeling of connectedness to the world and to the things that you're passionate about. It, it, it affects you physically and mentally. You know, how many times have you heard, well, you know, mom's doing really good, but she, we, we did have to put her, she did need extra care and we put her in a nursing home and she died in a month. And it seemed incredible because everything, she seemed pretty well off. Or, you know, dad was doing really good, but, you know, he retired and he got his first social security check and he was dead in a month. You know, how many times have you heard these stories colloquially? I don't think we understand it from a scientific point of view yet, but there's a lot of, you know, objective evidence out there that this causes Cognitive decline and physical decline when you when you don't have that. And it's a real danger, particularly in the United States, where people over the age of 60 become devalued very quickly. I think in other countries, not so much, but in this country, for sure. And it, it you, you got to fight that. you got to fight that if you don't want to just live an average lifespan. That's very well said. Yeah, I, I agree wholeheartedly with you. And in, in our culture, we, we don't honor the... The aging and the wisdom that comes with that, the way other cultures do, and to your point, colloquially, we do see that's a very you you just made a couple of of uh, examples there, and I think one hundred percent of the people listening to that can certainly relate to that. They know somebody like that, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, Steve, what's next for you? What what's on the horizon? So you know, I'm really trying to grow my practice with the same people you you're working with which has not been my focus up until I started the Masculine Method. Mostly I was with more elite athletes, military guys that wanted to go to special operation, federal law enforcement, things like that. And obviously, I've, I've had civilian clients too. But I'm really trying to grow into training more and more seniors because I, 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 it's incredibly rewarding. I'm sure you've been, you've been doing it, so you see it. It's incredibly rewarding to, to do that because – not only am I working with guys that, hey, they want to do better, they want to have a specific career, they all those kind of things, working with people that it's really completely changing their life, maybe even adding years to their lifespan or adding years to their health span. And that's pretty rewarding. So I, I, I want to kind of focus on that. And one of the things that I think you, you can definitely uh, understand, as you get older and you do gain this wisdom, you, I, and I, th I see it in other people too, Really want to share it. Really want to share that the, the things that we've learned. It, it, we see people out there doing really crazy things, and it would be inappropriate for us to go up, and tap them on the shoulder, saying, "You're doing something that's really crazy." Because I've learned in my 63 years how bad that is. So you can't do it that way. But you're you're almost genetically predisposed to uh, to want to share it, and I, that's what's next for me. I hope is growing my my practice as far as working with seniors. And trying to show them what elite fitness is and show them what real fitness is and health is and achieve some real longevity. Okay, thanks for sharing that. And that you had mentioned the Mansfield Method, and that's the name of your practice, right? So if people are hearing this and they would like to communicate with you, reach out to you, potentially work with you, what's the best way for folks to, to get in touch with you? Yeah, the best way is through the Mansfield Method, you know, Mansfield Method website, mansfieldmethod.com. Uh, you can email me at steve at the Mansfield Method directly, and I, I can consult with you that way, you know, especially in today's times. A lot of the stuff's done remotely, Zoom, all those kind of things, and I can do those kind of things just from a consulting point of view all the way up to nutrition and, and uh, workouts, uh, whatever you want to do. Those are the two easiest way. Instagram, of course, I think is where I met you. Uh, you can also, you know, ping me on Instagram. Uh, I, I saw a blog post from you about how only 20% of seniors are listening to podcasts. It's yeah. like, oh my God, it's, it's tough. a tough crowd. <laughs> you know, our market is pretty tough. Yeah, to, it to is. Yeah. A lot 
I'm, I'm on a mission to get more seniors to listen to podcasts as well. Uh, I want them to be healthy and I want them listening to podcasts. There's a podcast about every subject known to man. It was shocking to me to find out that so few people are, uh, especially older people, are using this technology. Yeah, and it's similar with Instagram. Uh, you're, I'm not seeing them on, on that either. But right. I want to mention that's the way you can, you can get a hold of me. But most seniors at least know how to email me and how to get to my website, which is the primary way to do it. All right. Well, Steve, I'd like to thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your journey and all of your knowledge with us. You are a fantastic ambassador for healthy aging, and I just wish you all the best in all of your future endeavors. Well, same to you. I appreciate you having me. Well, that's our show for today, folks. If you enjoyed today's episode, please tell your friends and please consider subscribing and giving us a five-star review. All the show notes and much more are available at our website at silver-edge.com. That's silver-edge.com. So until next time, stay strong.